Hello, I'm Tony Guida. This is My New York. Not much in our lives remains constant over the years, let alone for two generations. But as a New Yorker, I'm proud to salute one of the fabulous constants. Saturday Night Live, the program has been called a cross between 60 Minutes and Monty Python. Whatever it is, it's damn near a miracle it gets on the air at all. <laughs> Don Roy King is the wizard at the controls of Saturday Night Live, and he's here to talk about his Saturday Night Miracles next. I am delighted to welcome to the program Don Roy King, director of Saturday Night Live, now in his 10th year and probably got a good hold on the job with six Emmys in the bag already. Welcome. Well, thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. I am jealous. I have to start with that. I'm jealous. You had the best job in television and uh, people like me wish they had that job. I don't want to correct you, but I think I've got the best job in the world. And uh, Great. I couldn't agree with you more. It is thrilling and challenging and a giant mountain to climb every week, but I have never had more fun climbing. How often do you hear that, Don, that, you, boy, you got the best job in the world? Every day. Yeah. And it does not, uh, I don't get tired of it. At, no, at, at, why would you? Yeah. Uh, I understand, though, you didn't think you got the job from Lorne Michael, the, the father of Saturday Night Live. When you interviewed with Lorne, you thought it was no good, right? Lorne is uh, not particularly easy to read. He yeah. is not particularly warm and giving, uh, and he can be cold and distant. And when I first met him, I thought, well, it was kind of cool to get into his office at least, but there's no chance that he's going to take a chance on me. Primarily because I had lots of television experience, lots of live experience, lots of experience directing music and every kind of genre that Saturday Night Live makes fun of. But I had never directed much sketch comedy, and that certainly is the yeah. crux of, uh, of the show. But uh, he took a risk, and uh, I had a steep learning curve, but kind of making it to the top. Well, now. I think you've arrived. I mean, live television is in your DNA. You did uh, the morning shows on ABC and CBS for all those years. You did the Mike Douglas show. I mean, live television is... You look up the word live television in the, in the dictionary and you're the picture of you. The first time I directed multiple cameras in a live setting uh, was in college. And I said, I like this. It feels like being a quarterback of a football team. I'm mm barking orders and I'm following the actions that happens. I'm keeping my eye on the clock. And if a mistake uh, happens, I get by it, move on to the next thing. I've got to convey what I want, the instantaneous decisions I'm making. I've got to convey that to a team very efficiently and quickly and, and have them pull together uh, to, to, to make sure that the people at home see what we want them to see. And uh, that adrenaline rush is a uh, 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 one that I've always liked as a, as a kid athlete and have loved for the 46 years I've directed television. Still get that same rush every Saturday night. Did a lot, some, none of your experience in directing live television, which a lot, a lot of which was news, uh, did that translate well into you know, coming to a sketch comedy show? Except for directing actors and staging scenes, yeah. in, except for uh, mounting one-act plays, uh, I was pretty comfortable, and it did translate. Certainly directing music, certainly directing fake news uh, <laughs> uh, came pretty easily. Uh, but that whole concept of how best to tell a joke, how best to, to, to visualize what a writer is intended, how best to choreograph cameras to make sure that the story gets told in the most efficient and the funniest way possible, oh, that, that took some time. How many cameras 
uh, on Saturday night? Run? A good question, and most people would be surprised to hear we only use five. Really? I'm surprised to hear that. Only five. And one of them is a, a, a crane. Right. Uh, uh, we have a crane. No, you've, got a, yeah. you've got a modern jib, a lovely floating camera that is uh, Which operated. Which is now taking this shot and, and moving. And it's operated yeah. manually. It floats beautifully. It's, uh, it, 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 it is one man at the back of, uh, uh, of, this, of this beautiful device with a tiny little camera on the end. We instead use an old-fashioned giant machine that has a driver a cameraman in a bucket, two men who do nothing but move the arm up and down, and this giant old-fashioned piece of machinery slides in and out uh, of, the, of the set. We, we have a brilliant operator, and it does more than it should do, but it basically it's outdated and cumbersome and not, not nearly as versatile and as you can you have. go back to Lorne now and say, Lorne, I can save you... You know, a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. Get I, one of these. I said, and I know ten, where they have one. I said that <laughs> ten years ago. But what he says, and th this is part of his brilliance, he said the people that come into that studio and sit in the stands and watch that piece of equipment move by, they say, "Wow, this is different. This is big time, old fashioned show business," and it feels special. In the, in the studio audience, special in a way that you yeah. never see anywhere else. I can endorse that. I, I've been in the studio audience, I think, only once. But, you know, even though I'm in the business, uh, I, I, I thought, oh, my God, look at this thing. Yeah. Going from one side of exactly. that huge exactly. studio, 8H, to the other. And oh, it's, it is impressive. And we still use cue cards. And, yeah. and right. it is, uh, in some ways, a very, very old-fashioned show. Well, let's talk about what I referred to as the miracles and you referred to a minute ago as climbing the mountain. I mean, 90 minutes of live television a week, sketch comedy in this case, is uh, a big enough challenge. But the way you guys do it, I, I mean, I'm surprised that we don't have on Saturday night at 1130 and you turn on NBC and you, I'm surprised there isn't a sign of that. Sorry, we're not ready. <laughs> I, I, talk about the process that brings this show to air. Well, that's another thing Lauren says. We go on at 1130, um, not because we're ready, but because, but because it's, it's 1130. 11 that's exactly yeah. right. It is. If you'd asked me 10 years ago, can a show even be done this way? I would have said, absolutely not. The stakes are too high. The, 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 the challenge is too big. Why would, why would it be done the way we do it? And here's what happens. The, the host comes in on Monday and meets mm -hmm. with the writers. The writers, you know, it's a half hour meeting. The writers throw out an idea or two, many of which never even evolve into sketches. It's, I think it's designed to kind of scare the host. <laughs> the writers come in on Tuesday. They write sometimes all night Tuesday into Wednesday. Wednesday afternoon at three, maybe four o'clock, we sit around a big table and read as many as 45 sketches, script in hand. First time you're looking at correct. potential that's, that's, sketches. That's correct. Wednesday. And Wednesday afternoon. Yeah, yeah. And that takes hours to read 45 sketches. And the, the, the room is filled with other people, too, who serve as a sort of pseudo audience. So Lauren gets an idea of how it plays just to the ear. Yeah. And at 8 or 8, 8.30, he will have narrowed it down to the 12 or 13 will actually mount. And I take those scripts into a different room. And for the first time at 9 o'clock, the set designers and the hair and makeup people and the wardrobe people and the special effects people find out what we're actually going to mount. Wednesday night, they start from scratch. Thursday, we go back in and rehearse the guest band. We'll tape some promos, and then at 2 o'clock, we'll rehearse some, some of the simple sketches. Like and, a, and, and we're in Thursday afternoon, and you still haven't put actors, let's call them, on stage in their sets to try the, the bits. That's correct. After we, after we do some of, that, uh, some of that music rehearsing, we'll rehearse simple sketches, the ones that don't need many sets or props. We can just use rehearsal flats or, or, or old cups or something or chairs like this, just stick them on, get them up there. And uh, I rehearse them, block them on, on stage first and then on camera. And uh, each sketch gets about an hour's work. We'll come back in Friday. Now we have a little bit more to work with and the more complex sketches will get rehearsed. And we spend all day each, each again getting about an hour's work. 
and now there's starting to be a few more items on the walls and a few more props for them to handle and some stand-in right. uh, special effects, some smoke when we need it. And, and uh, then Saturday we come back in and I walk around and say, wow, where did this all come from? There have been set designers painting flats and floors and props have been gathered and suddenly it's come to life. And every all of those 12 sketches have their own little atmospheres, their own little rooms, their own little uh, environments. And we then rehearse each sketch again. That takes till about five, break for a meal, come back and rehearse a weekend update for the first time. Stop again and do a dress rehearsal in front of a live audience. Right, there's a run, yeah, dress rehearsal, run through it like eight o'clock. Correct. As you get to this point, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, how many hours, what kind of day are we talking about? Are we talking about 10, 12 hour days? Maybe more. Maybe it depends on the, the cast at the same time is going out to do uh, digital shorts or fake commercials yeah. and uh, they are uh, being bussed back and forth to, to tape things in the field. So all of those field pieces are be, being done simultaneously with our studio work. Uh, so some people are there from eight in the morning till one in the morning. OK, so it's Saturday now and it's eight. PM roughly, and yes. you're going to you're going to do the show in what we call a dress rehearsal, a live run through. But it's right. but what you do is maybe two hours. It's not ninety minutes, right? That's exactly right. We as much as as much as thirty minutes more material than we actually need, and uh, it, we run it like a regular show with with commercial holes, and and it feels to the studio audience like they're seeing a real stage performance. We don't stop, and uh, it's mm -hmm. fully propped and dressed, and, and and it looks like real television. But uh, in the meantime, Lauren is saying, "Well, that that sketch doesn't work, or that sketch." Well, this is, is the too part long. that that just blows my mind. Me too. You do, let's say, two hours. It's ten o'clock at night. Thirty minutes has to be thrown away. Right. And you're going on the air at eleven thirty. Correct. And Lorne is in there going, no, yes, no. Correct. And and you're going, oh my God, what what are you doing? <laughs> we have a meeting at ten thirty in his office where he explains to us how the show has been reordered. Up on the board, we see which sketches have been killed entirely. And then I get my, my script back at 11 o'clock. And you get your script back, it's the been, final script at 11. It's been turned over to the uh, script department. They're writing in the changes that the writers have made. Even to the sketches, the sketches that are staying in the show are, right. are, are significantly edited, changed, rewritten, and I'll say, wait a minute, this page is all gone. And I'll say, well, here's a new line written in here. I'll say, wait a minute, this is a different ending. How are we gonna, how are we gonna do that? And, oh my God. And he's been known to recast uh, a role between dress rehearsal and air. No. An actor will go into a, a, a sketch. Uncle, he's never. Uncle Festus in the in the run through was <laughs> That's correct. was uh, oh, Dan Aykroyd. <laughs> That's correct. But now it's uh, now it's Keenan Thompson. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my God! And, uh, and the cue cards have been redone to reflect all of those changes as well. And now, between Wednesday and Saturday, I have very meticulously blocked every single shot, with right. every single camera angle. And I'll say, you've got shot forty-two. It's a two-shot, and you'll be zooming to the man on the right. And suddenly, I'll say, oh, "Wait a minute! That's uh, all. That's gone. That's gone." And I have to have a quick camera meeting. Thirty minutes before showtime, that's gone quick camera meeting in the control room. I say, all right, uh, in this sketch, kill shots 22, 24, and 27. And wait a minute, 28 camera two, not camera one, and uh, make it a three shot. And we'll, oh, wait a minute, that line's killed. Forget it. Let's go back. And, and it, it is a panic every single week. And every single week, I am cursing Lorne Michaels under my breath saying, why did we have to do this? Why is this change being made? Why is it so difficult to do this show? And then at one o'clock in the morning, we finished, and I look back and I say, he was right. That was funnier that way. Or that new ending worked. I, yeah, it was funnier. You, you know, you credit his intelligence, his comedic intelligence, but... Brilliance. A half-hour network television live that basically comes together at half an hour before it goes on. I'm, I'm thinking of what John, John McEnroe was famous for saying and wrote a book with this title, You Cannot Be Serious. <laughs> you cannot. I'm serious. I can't do it that way. Uh, 
Well, that's what I said 10 years ago. And the fact is, uh, he is serious. Have you gotten, now you've 10 years of this, you, you must have an endorsement with Xanax, right? You must, you've been doing <laughs> well, When I started, I was six foot two. I, <laughs> <laughs> However, it oh. is, uh, it still is that adrenaline rush I first felt back in college. It still is it's just a, a wonderful feeling to make people laugh and clap and think. And it is, uh, as a result, by far the most rewarding, exhilarating show I've ever done. Let's talk about back in college, Penn State. You, we, I think you wanted to be an actor. That you, theater is in your blood, and, and you gravitated toward being on the stage, right? I didn't have the guts to tell my dad I was going to be an acting major, so I got into the closest thing possible, the broadcasting department. But I spent most of my time in the theater. And it really wasn't until that, that class I mentioned in my senior year where I said, whoa, I can do this, and I kind of get a kick out of it, and it has a sort of performing rush to it as well. And so uh, uh, when I graduated, I said the same thing. I, I don't have, I, I can't move to New York and be a struggling actor. Maybe I'll work my way in the back door and pursued a television career that kind of worked out, and uh, more of it behind the scenes than in front of the camera. But it was, uh, it still had, it still had some, attachment to show business and that was enough you, you've had a superb career i just wonder given this first love acting uh do you think about the regret not doing more of it or do you ever think about that road not taken there was there was a, a time when i was directing good morning america and cbs this morning mm -hmm. when i felt you know i've kind of played it safe and I've kind of uh, given up on my real dream here. And that, uh, but the work I was doing was was challenging. It was rewarding. It was it was um, in, in in many ways uh, enough. But there was a part of me that that felt that I'd kind of sold out. Mm. Uh, I got an opportunity, however, in the early two thousands to direct some. Broadway musicals for television, right. not really direct the musicals, but capture them for, for television. And, uh, and for that brief week or so where we would be actually capturing a Broadway show, I felt, well, that's, that's the old rush that I felt, the magic of theater, bringing, making people laugh and clap. And, 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 uh, and that was close, the closest I had gotten to that point. And then suddenly in 2006, I get the opportunity to actually stage these one-act sketches and be a part of a television show that is pure show business and uh, have been pretty challenged and thrilled for 10 years. I, I'm thinking of the, the experience of an actor or someone with an interest in theater and some experience, even though you didn't pursue it that much. But it would seem that from that, you would take at least uh, 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 an understanding and a, and a gut uh, a sense of the relationship between a performer and his or her audience. And I wonder if you agree with that and, and then how that might inform live television and what you direct in, in Saturday Night Live in, in terms of how you understand that relation. It's an excellent observation and it's and it's rare. It, it, so often it's so easy when you sit in the control room to think well when I say take one the whole world sees camera one and when I say cue him that's when he talks you start to think of yourself of this is my show and I'm the one who's 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 the, the most important. But having been on the other side and knowing a little bit about that feeling uh, and the vulnerability and the risks that one takes when, when you are uh, on camera, um, I came to understand how important the performer is and how uh, vulnerable he is and, and how important it is to, to keep him comfortable and happy so that he can do his mm -hmm. best. And 
especially in sketch comedy, I, I've approached it from the, the standpoint of the camera shots don't matter if they tell the story properly. And I don't want to show off what the cameras can do or a great angle that I can get or some quick reaction shot that is, people say, oh, that's a great shot. If people are saying, oh, that's a great shot, then they're, they're being pulled out of the story. Exactly. They're being distracted from the, the purpose, the, the through line of, of the sketch. And, uh, and I've become much less intrusive uh, as a director. And less much, is more. Absolutely. And much more sensitive to the issues of, uh, of, a, of a performer and his, the risks that he or she is taking. Let's talk about a performer in your family. <clears throat> you, did, you didn't uh, reach that uh, goal, but y your daughter, Cameron, well, is, uh, what, a senior at the, at the performing arts? She's at LaGuardia High School, the famed school, and she is a senior thriving and uh, in the drama department, and I could not be more proud of just her getting in, but, but doing well is... Um, uh, and doing well at what? Does she want to be a, an actress? Does she want to act, I guess is what I'm saying, or does she want to uh, do a, some other part of the business? She's a pretty good actress. She is a remarkable actress for an 18-year-old girl. But after her sophomore year, she said, um, Daddy, I don't, I don't think I want to be an actor. I think I want to be a director. No. I started to puff <laughs> up a little bit. And she said, but not like you. I, I want to be a real director. Oh, really? What, what is a real A real director? director directs actors on stage, oh. not that TV comedy stuff. I love that independence and that teenage arrogance, and I am thrilled, and that's kind of the way she's headed. I, I'm proud that I've taken her, I've exposed her to a lot of theater uh, uh, over the years. Oh, sure. But she'll turn to me in the, at, at intermission and say, I think that first song was a little too long and, and they didn't develop the relationship between the father and the daughter in a way that, that, that justifies what happens afterwards. Wow. So, yeah, I think, yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. <laughs> She's a director. <laughs> That's great. And she loves the whole process from the first written word to the strike at the end uh, uh, of the run. She just has that love of, of theater and, and that, that makes me happy too. Well, I hope she gets the program she wants at, at the next level, college. And uh, I hope I look for her. I hope you're interviewing her. I'd, I'd be happy to <laughs> <laughs> send her this way. Oh, uh, uh, that's, that's marvelous. I, I, live theater, you know, for those of us in New York, which we have so much, Broadway, off-Broadway, off-off-Broadway, right. and, you, and you see such interesting, marvelous, thought-provoking, lousy, in some cases, production. But, but there it is. People are creating illusions on stage all over this city every night. And it, it, it's just extraordinary uh, culture we have. And to be part of it, even in, at our distance, is, uh, I'm, I'm delighted. I couldn't agree more. First time I came to New York, I grew up near a little suburb of Pittsburgh, and I got hooked on acting in eighth grade, and my eighth grade dramatics teacher, uh, Miss Ann Bowden, mm. ran the Curtain Call Club, and that was her life. Wow. And every Easter, she would bring two or three students to New York for a little a weekend trip, got to see some Broadway shows, and, and, and do a little tour of New York. And I was in eighth grade and came with Miss Bowden and three ninth grade girls, and we went to see The Sound of Music and Miracle Worker, and I developed this teenage crush on New York and particularly Broadway. I thought, I can't wait to get back here and to be a part of the magic that's in that theater and in, that, and in those streets. Well, let's talk a little bit before we run out of time. You're, you're the uh, what, creative director of Broadway Worldwide, which okay. does what? Bring plays and theater Correct. to television. Correct, yeah. You did, the, did uh, Memphis... That's correct. Uh, Smokey Joe's Cafe, Jekyll and Hyde. Is there a production being mounted now for, for Broadway Worldwide? I mean, is there something being translated? There are things being talked about all the time. It's a very complex procedure. Yeah. And so far, they haven't made much money. Uh, they were designed to be pay-per-view, and um, it, w it was hard to convince people that pay-per-view was worth paying money for 
well, plays. I, I when when I saw that in your background, I I, I was so uh, wishing that uh, this would work and work dramatically well because I, I remember an experience. I, I remember many experiences, but one in the theater, the original uh, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. Yes. I saw that on Broadway, and, and it's the, uh, one of the few times, maybe the only time, when that ended, when the thing, the final scene, and you know, I hate this, yeah. I sat there stunned. People were applauding. I couldn't get up. And, and all what I wanted, what I'm trying to say is, I would love to see that production again, that production, you know, on and tape. And you never will. And, 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 you, and we never will. You're absolutely right. And it's not just capturing for posterity. It's also that, that millions of people around the world would love to see that kind of theater, but they can't get to New York. And this gives them the, uh, the second, the next best thing. We can take you into that theater and put you in the best seat in the house and give you a, a sense of live theater and the, uh, and the magic that that, that, that creates and, and the visceral, uh, gut-wrenching opportunities to, to be a part of, of, of theater. I have to ask you, finally, the after-show parties. Are they as wild as the papers make them sound? Wait a minute. There's an after-show party party i didn't nobody told me that okay we've been I have never been invited i've never been invited <laughs> I, I i've never gone to one i a really little, i'm a little bit beat up by one. i i can imagine don roy king it is such a delight to have you here and to hear take us backstage at saturday night live thank you so much my pleasure i enjoyed it thanks don <laughs>